So glad you guys are here today, excited to gather with you guys as we worship the Lord and hear from him and as he helps us become more like Jesus. Um, Y'all stand with us as we worship together today. I'm going to be seated for just a second. If you don't know me, my name is Owen. I'm one of the pastors here at Progression Church. 
And so I want to say welcome. Um, welcome to this, if you're first time or one of you many times. Um, our desire as a staff at the church is for this to be a, a spiritual home for you. So on Sundays we come together to worship together as a spiritual family under Christ um, and to give him the praise that he deserves. So welcome. This morning I want to read out of Psalm 37. And my prayer that it would um, maybe uh, encourage us to worship the Lord this morning. Starting in verse 1, it says, Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. For they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land of befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your, your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. This, this psalm is the first um, um, verse here. Helps us understand that many times we look around the world and we see those who are evil and, and doing horrible things. We see them getting raised up in the world. We see them enjoying the pleasures of this world. And maybe for some of you, like, that frustrates you. And maybe some of those things have happened to you where these evil people have, have um, caused you um, to just ask God, like, say, why, what's going on here? But we have a good um, promise in 3 through 5 that we should trust in the Lord and do good. We should dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. We should delight ourselves in the Lord. Commit your way to the Lord and trust in him, and he will act. Ultimately, we know that, that God is good, and, and when he says that he will give us the desires of our heart, as we seek and delight ourselves in the Lord, our desires are conformed to his. And therefore, when he says he will give us the desires of our heart, he will, because they will be his desires. So as we worship this morning, may this be a practice of delighting yourself in the Lord. May this be a practice of you trusting in the Lord. May we continue to worship week after week and give the Lord the worship that he deserves because of the goodness that he gives to us. So I'll lead us in a time of prayer. May we continue to worship. Take a moment just to remind yourselves of the way that you should delight in the Lord, all the good things you've done. Take a moment just to ask the Lord that, that he would help you to trust in him. Lord, as we continue in worship, I pray that, that all the outside worries and all the outside things we, we struggle with would just be removed from our mind. That by your spirit, we would seek to delight ourselves in you this morning. That we would seek to worship you out of trust in you and seek to give you the worship that only you deserve in Jesus name Amen, let's worship
time we sing. What would it be like?
Good morning, church. Anybody glad to be here today? We good? Amen? Amen? Amen. Man, I was glad to be with you, sing with you guys. Man, singing with y'all each week this semester has been just such a blessing to my heart. As someone who makes a joyful noise but is not good at singing, it's nice hearing y'all sometimes, um, but it's also an encouragement. You ever notice, like, sometimes when you sing, just the fact that someone singing beside you builds your faith? You ever notice that? I think that's one of the beautiful things about church, man, that we build each other up, and you do that for me as well. So, Glad to be here, man. Glad to, to teach through Philippians, as you saw. We only got three weeks left. So if you're tired of Philippians, hey, we got three more weeks, you know. If you love it, well, we still got three more weeks. So there we go. Um, but we are in chapter four, chapter four. So if you want to turn your Bibles, this we're going to be Philippians chapter four. We're going to look at two verses today. Um, and I would say they're mo- it's moderately spicy. It's moderately spicy, okay. Um, but I think it's going to be super, super helpful for all of us. Uh, if, if you know Christ, if you don't know Christ, I think it'd be helpful. It's going to be especially helpful if you know Jesus already. Um, but let me kind of set up where we're going to go today. We're going to look at verse, verse 2 and 3 of chapter 4. Um, but before we get there, let me kind of ask you this question. Uh, when you were a kid, I don't know, 9, 10, something like that, um, did you ever have drama with a friend? Anybody have a drama moment, right? Uh, I don't know, you know, you got into some beef, anybody, just let's just raise our hand if it's like, yeah, I had a little moment at the, yeah, recess got dicey in third grade, you know, got spicy, had some moments, you know, uh, I was thinking about that just because I've been talking with our own kids about, you know, how they hang and with all the little relational things that they have going on in, <laughs> in second grade and kindergarten, um, but it reminded me that, you know, I think of myself as a guy, it's pretty easy going, pretty, you know, didn't have a lot of issues with people, but I was reminded, like, even when I was a kid, I had some moments, you know. I had some Taylor Swift moments, you know, maybe not that dramatic. <laughs> uh, but I remember when I was about 9 or 10, probably 9, I was uh, hanging out in my mom's school. So my mom was a teacher, um, and my best friend, his mom was, like, the administrative uh, person at the school. So we always hung out before school. We had to get there super early. So we would hang out in my mom's school, like her classroom, her first grade class, and then we would walk over to, we called it the middle school, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade was like next door in a different building, in a different like school, so we'd go over there. So we'd hang out before school, and we would do, uh, we'd play Oregon Trail, right, old school on the computer, you know, and mainly we just hunted, that's pretty much all we did, and then dad of whatever, dysentery or whatever happens, you know, every time you play it. So we'd play that. Um, and this particular day, I don't know, I guess this is like my best friend. They're like, I don't know what was, I mean, we were just having a bad day. I don't know. But we're kind of upset. I don't know what happened about Oregon Trail or Legos, whatever we were doing that day. But we got kind of mad at each other. Um, and then, you know, there was a push, all right? A uh, little bros, there was a push. And then there was a punch, but no headshots because we were best friends. So it was like a little back punch, you know? Um, and then my buddy yelled, I'm going to go tell my mom. And then like a Christ follower, I yelled, go ahead. You know what I'm saying? And then he ruined out, you know? And I was like, okay, what a great start to the day. This is at 7.15 in the morning. We have like a little mini fight, you know? And then that's enough. Like that's already weird. But then we go to the same school. So we didn't walk over together that day. I don't know where he was. Uh, hopefully not telling his mom, you know? And then we end up at school. And then I'm thinking, I'm going to see him at recess. And I'm like, what is the situation? You know what I'm saying? Like, are we good? Is it like on site? We throw him down? Are we still buddies? Because I already got over it. I've been over it for three hours, you know? But I don't know what's going on in his head. So it's kind of tension, you know? You know what I'm talking about? You're like, hey, I just kind of like kind of punched this guy in the back and he shoved me into the lockers. What are we doing? You know what I'm saying? So then I see him and we're like in a little group. We're all like talking about whatever. Everything seems okay. And then I'm like, man, I'm like over this, and I don't know where he's at, but I don't, just kind of inching in there, and I was just like, the best I could do, my nine-year-old self trying to be good at conflict resolution, I was like, something to the effect of this, hey, man, my bad, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And he's like, my bad, and I was like, dad, and that was it. Did we, did we finish? Or, I mean, were we good? I don't know, but it felt like we realized we weren't going to fight each other anymore, so we just kind of went out about our day. And if you're like, man, that's not great conflict resolution. It's not. It's like, that's what you do at nine. You know, and here's the deal. Whenever you're young and you're trying to figure out all this stuff, it's hard to deal with conflict, right? You're going to have it, you know. No matter how good you are with people, you're going to have conflict with other people. And what I've noticed is, is all of us struggled with it as a kid. But can I be honest? Most of us still struggle with this as grownups. We may not be as bad at it as we were. But we deal with it in all kind of different ways. You know, we might have passive aggression towards someone. We might kind of halfway 
uh, reconcile. We may struggle with it in completely different ways, but I think conflict resolution is a struggle for most of us as human beings, and this is what we're going to see in our text today. Even in the church, we can have conflict. Even in the church, we can have conflict. Even with brothers and sisters in Christ, we can have conflict. But Paul is trying to instruct the church to work through minor issues. Um, and he only gives us two verses. And you're like, man, Paul, I could use like a whole book about this. You know what I'm saying? But inspired by the Lord, I feel like there's a lot he gives us in these two verses to at least get us started in the area of growth and conflict resolution. Okay, so... Chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. We kind of catch up a little bit of what's going on in the letter. Um, early in the letter, we see that Paul's kind of doing a little bit with like some big picture issues maybe in the Philippian church. This is a church he loved, he was proud of, and it was a faithful um, light to its community. But he's kind of talked a lot about pride and humility, probably because he knew that they were struggling with pride, right? So there's probably this big picture issue of pride that he's dealing with. And then in chapter 3, there's a little bit of like a theological problem as we have some people coming into church, the Judaizers, who are bringing kind of an addition to the gospel. And we talked about gospel math and heresy math, that it's Jesus plus nothing equals everything, right? And that's, it's not Jesus plus something. And then that, no, no, that's, that's getting it wrong. And he's kind of making sure they get that right. So there's a little bit of theological issue that they're kind of working through. And then in chapter 4, verse 2 and 3, we see him address two real people that are in the church and he doesn't give us a whole lot of information about what was going on between them. What we do know is they had conflict. And he's going to give a couple instructions as to how they should overcome it. And I want us to learn from that. So I just want to read our two verses. And then we're going to talk about what we can learn from this passage and how we can get better at reconciling with those who we struggle with. Okay? So Paul writing this to people that he knows. Okay? And he says, I urge Euodia and I urge Sintake, which is a hard word to say, to agree in the Lord. So this is verse 2. So we know that they have issues, and he's telling them to do something, to agree in the Lord. And then let's see in verse 3. He says, yes, also, I also ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side, along with Clement and the rest of my coworkers whose names are in the book of life. So what we find out really quickly is this. There's conflict between two real women in the church, but these are godly women. These are people who love Jesus. These are people who had served with Paul, co-workers whose names are in the book of life. He's like, wink, wink, I know you're in Christ, right? This is a big deal. These aren't just people that were loosely affiliated. These were not people that were maybe converts. These are people that Paul considered co-workers that loved Jesus. And even though they loved Jesus and they're part of the same church family, they had some kind of conflict, right? So how did they deal with it? How did Paul instruct them to deal with it? All right? I want to give you a couple points today, all right, that I think will be helpful wherever you are coming with this. Because you might not be struggling with it in the church, but you might be struggling with it at work, right? Or you might be struggling in your families or with your friend groups. Or, you know, you might have a group text and somebody got taken out recently. You know what I'm saying? Like, you got something going on. How do we deal with conflict? I want to give you two things. The first one is this. Reconciliation begins... When both people seek God above all else. And I'm talking to believers to believers here. The context of this conflict is this is Christian and Christian in the church, right? But we can apply this to Christian and Christian really anywhere. And we can try to apply this really with anybody. But being a believer is key because the power to reconcile comes from the Holy Spirit. It says reconciliation begins when both people seek God above all else. Where do you see this? This see this in the command that Paul gives to these two women who love Jesus but had conflict. He says in verse 2, he says that he asks them or he urges them, he pleads with them, he's begging with them to agree in the Lord. They disagree about something, right? That's when they have conflict. But what he's saying is, I want you to agree in the Lord. What he wants them to do is say, hey, I know that you love Jesus. I know that you're strong in your faith. I know that you've even done great things from God. And right now you're at odds. But even though you're at odds, here's my urge to you. Agree in the Lord above everything else. Ultimately say this, that we're going to sit underneath, even though we disagree, we're going to sit underneath the kingship and the lordship of Jesus on this issue. We're going to say, you know what? If we can't agree on everything, we are going to agree in the Lord. What does God want us to do in this situation? How would he want us to handle this? 
to agree in the Lord here is for them to say, even though we disagree, we're going to put ourselves under the authority of the word of God. And here's the good news. The scriptures, though highly theological, and thank God for that, it teaches us about God and how we're saved and all those things. It also is extremely practical because people have been having problems since people have been people. All right. Well, it's, it's, it's really since sin entered the world. All right. Genesis three, there's problems from then on. There's problems. And because of that, the scriptures gives us all kind of information, all kind of encouragement as how to deal with this. I want to give you a few things if you're in Christ. If we're going to agree in the Lord and we have conflict, brother and sister in Christ, if we have conflict, how do we deal with it? Here's some things that the scriptures teach us about dealing with conflict. First thing is this, Ephesians 4.32. This is just one of them. Um, Paul, in a different letter, says, And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another just as God also forgave you in Christ. He tells us to forgive because we've been forgiven, right? That's what he's saying. He links this to the gospel. Beautiful connection by Paul here. And he's saying, hey, believers, this is written to the churches, be kind and compassionate to one another. All right, cool. And also forgive one another just as God also forgave you in Christ Jesus. Sometimes we struggle to forgive because we forget how much we've been forgiven, right? I know that's me sometimes. Sometimes I forget about all the things that I've done to God, that God has forgiven me a past, present, future forgiveness. That's what God has done for me in Christ Jesus. And he's saying, remember that. Whenever you consider forgiving one another. And I was talking to my kids about this uh, recently. We're talking about forgiveness and how it's hard, but God calls us to do it. If we're followers of Jesus, we're called to forgive. And I was talking about this. Here's the thing about God and his word and his principles, the things he tells us true. Not only is it going to be good for the person whom we forgive, to forgive someone else is actually good for us as well. That God cares about both parties in that struggle. It's good for them, and it's good for us. You know, this is what Augustine said, one of the early church fathers. He says, resentment is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. Right? This is what he says. Resentment, holding on to grudges, is like drinking poison. It's like we think that if we can hold on to this grudge, if we think we can decide, you know what, I'm not going to forgive them, and that's how I'm going to do And by doing that, that's going to kind of hold them accountable. It's really... Like us drinking the poison and hoping for them to die. It hurts us to hold on to these grudges. It hurts us to not forgive as well as them. And God knows what's best for everybody involved. His word is true. If we agree in the Lord, he tells us that we're called to forgive. He also tells us that to love one another, brothers and sisters in Christ, is a mark of discipleship. It's a mark of maturity. This is what we're supposed to be about. Paul, I mean, Jesus says this to the disciples right before he takes the cross, John 13. I give you a new command. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This, and this carried a punch for those who heard it, for the disciples who lived with them for three, three and a half years, because it starts with, I'll give you a new command, love one another. Okay, I've heard that before. Just as I have loved you, Jesus, who spent all this time with the disciples, he's like, remember, for the last three years, the way that I've loved you, that's how I want you to now love one another. And the way that you love one another, this text is not even explicitly about loving the world. He's saying, love your church family, other believers in Christ. He's saying love brothers and sisters in the way that Jesus loved the disciples. That's a mark of true discipleship. And this is what he calls us to, this radical love for one another. That yes, we should love the world, absolutely. But in this text, he's saying love one another with this heart. And that's a mark of discipleship. You know, Jesus in, in, in Matthew said this, he talked about just the importance of dealing with this, these relational issues. And in the Sermon on the Mount, kind of talking about anger, and we're going to get all in this because, spoiler alert, Matthew's going to be our next book, so we're going to get there, so I'm not going to break it down too much. But he says, so if you're offering your gift on the altar and they remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled with your brother or sister, and then come offer your gift. He's saying, if you go and you're offering uh, sacrifice, you know, an old school church, how they were doing things in the old covenant, and then you remember, hey, I got beef that I haven't resolved. He's like, leave, go resolve it, come back and finish the sacrifice. He's trying to teach them how important unity is in the kingdom of God. 
that it's not like a minor thing. It's a big thing. It's a huge thing. And that's why Paul's taken a minute in this letter to address these women who love God and had served the Lord faithfully. He wanted them to work it out. And this is what I want you to know. It starts in our own hearts, right? If we're going to do this, it starts in our heart. Reconciliation, or at least forgiveness, begins in our hearts. Because forgiveness is something we can do as believers. God's given us the ability to forgive and the command to forgive. Forgiveness looks like us releasing someone of a debt. That can be a one-party thing. Reconciliation takes two people, right? You can do your part. They may not do your part, their part. That cannot lead, that ultimately doesn't lead to reconciliation as we would want it. But we can forgive. And it begins in our hearts. And it begins sometimes in the smallest of things. This last week, I was working at the house. And I was walking around doing something. I don't know. In between projects, I was doing something. I was thinking about something um, that another parent had said to me that wasn't really that big of a deal. But if I took it the worst possible way, it kind of could make you mad. You ever had those moments? They said something, and you're like, I don't think they meant anything by it. But if they did, that was mean. You ever had those moments? Probably the last, you know, three days you probably had that, right? So anyway, so I'm thinking about what the guy said. And I'm like, yeah, probably not a big deal. But then I just kind of started stewing on it, man. And I'm a pretty laid back person. But I started thinking, you know what? But if he did mean it that way and he said it again, guess what I'm going to say? You know, you all right at that moment? You kind of pre-plan your, your response. You're like, oh, yeah. I know what I would say next. And I wouldn't even say it mean. I would just say it like, boom, get them with it. You know what I'm saying? I was ready, you know? And I kind of was going down that. And I, I felt like my, my blood pressure getting up. You know, I wasn't mad, but I was kind of getting kind of ready. You know, like, oh, man. Oh, maybe, maybe we'll have this conversation this week. I'm ready. Preloaded. You know what I'm saying? And then as I'm getting fired up, this is what I feel like the Holy Spirit did to me. Stop. Just stop. First of all, you don't even know if he meant that. Second of all, stop pole vaulting over anthills. That's the way I think about it. That might be an old school country kind of thing right there. But I have heard it and believed it for a long time. Don't pole vault over anthills. This is a situation of this is something small, but in my heart, it's smart to become big. And I'm going to see this guy again in a couple days. And guess what's going to happen if I got resent in my heart? I'm going to be weird toward him. You know what I'm saying? Or I might say something towards him. But the Holy Spirit, what does he want to do? He wants me to forgive. So he reminds me. Stop. And in that moment, I had to stop and talk to the Lord, confess it to the Lord, and say, God, first of all, I should have chosen to think the best of this person instead of the worst of this person, but I didn't do that. And secondly, I shouldn't have let my heart keep running towards that because now I feel like I almost want to have this conversation with this person, and it ain't even his fault. I'm having a fight with him. He's at work and forgot that we ever talked about it, right? And so I had to have a moment of repentance and talk to the Lord and forgive and move on. And guess what? I forgave. I forgot about it later on until I had to write the sermon. You know what I'm saying? And then that's how it's supposed to be with these small things. See, reconciliation, or at least forgiveness, begins in our hearts. We have to fight those fights that we have in our hearts and our minds to not let little things become big things, to not always take things the worst possible way, to choose not to be offended or hold on to resent, but we are going to obey the Lord and forgive, forgive as we've been forgiven, love one another the way Christ loved the disciples, and seek reconciliation as quick as possible. If we do that, then there's going to be a lot more peace in our life. I don't, know if you've li- I don't know if you've gone through a season of being kind of dramatic, but there is a lack of peace when you're going through the drama. And there is a peace that comes from living right before God and with other people. Seek the peace, right? That's what Paul's saying. Here's the second thing. If need be, get someone to help you resolve your relational tension. If need be, right? For these small things, a lot of times we can just forgive in our hearts, right? We can deal with that in our own hearts. Hey, forgive. Holy Spirit, minister to me. Stop. Don't do that. Move on. Forgive. Don't let this become a big thing in your heart, right? That's what happens to us probably as believers a lot of the time. The Lord is helping correct us. But sometimes we're doing the best we can or the best we know to, but yet we still can't overcome this conflict. And in this church, it seems like these are people that love God, but yet we're still having conflict, and maybe they didn't know what to do with it. So he says in verse 3, he says, Yes, I also ask you, true partner, and true partner is someone that we don't know exactly who he's talking to. Could have been someone who would have known it, um, 
Or instead of true partner being translated that, it could be the Greek word that comes from that, and that was their name. It could be the leaders that were addressed early in the letter, like the deacons and the elders of the church. We don't know exactly who he's talking to, but I'll tell you this, whoever received the letter knew who he was talking to. You know what I'm saying? If he's like, yeah, yeah, he's talking to me, or he's talking to us. These are godly leaders in the church, or a godly leader in the church. And he says, yes, I also ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side along with Clement and the rest of the co-workers whose names are in the book of life. He is building these uh, women up and saying, look, I know they're godly. I know they love Jesus. But if they still got stuff, help them. Help them. Because sometimes we do need like a third party, somebody to help us think through stuff, right? And that can look like a lot of different ways. Sometimes that's just bringing kind of our frustrations to a, a godly friend in accountability, And saying, look, I'm having these thoughts, I'm having these frustrations, and I know that they're not godly, I'm struggling to get over, would you pray with me, right? And sometimes that's a good way to do things. You have a friend who will call you back to the the word of God and say, look, it is not right for you to hold on that, let go of that, forgive him. You know what I'm saying? Like, you need people in your life to do that. Sometimes it looks like having to get someone else to help you out. And I think this is what Paul is mentioning here, that sometimes you need a third party. You need somebody with outside perspective, somebody who's going to keep it real with you, but point you to the scriptures in godly counsel. This happens all the time, and I, I, if, if you never had to have this happen, it may feel weird, but just know this, like even in the church world, this is something that happens. Like in the church families that I've been a part of, there's been times when people needed help to solve stuff out, and that's okay. I think about it in marriage, this happens a lot of times, right? I was thinking about at a, a previous church I was at, I had a, a couple who was struggling with a really small thing, okay? As it seemed like it was a small thing. And they'd come to me and they're like, hey, we kind of have intention over this issue. And the issue wasn't one we would think was very big. They said, I'm really struggling. We're, str- we're kind of struggling right now um, with the issue of hunting, all right? And it wasn't like an ethical, moral debate of should he hunt or not hunt because, you know, that wasn't the issue. But it was that she thought he was hunting too much and he thought that he wasn't hunting enough, right? So it's just kind of like we have a hunting problem. And I'm like, man, this isn't, this isn't a problem. You know, we're going to be good. Come on, let's talk about it. So we talk about it, and, you know, from her perspective, he was gone too much. And his perspective, you know, he's like, well, I'm saying no a lot. You know, and I told you before we got married, I'm a hunter. So, you know, like, this is what you get, you know, kind of deal. And I'm like, okay. So we talked about that, right? We worked through it. I shared with him some scripture, and then we kind of walked through it. And it seemed like maybe they had come to agreement. And then uh, fast forward a few more months. Um, and the little thing had become a big thing, and it started something really, really small, but it really was more so probably evidence of bigger problems, and then the next time we talked, it went from, you're having this cute hunting problem to, I really hope that they can hold it together. It escalated kind of quickly, right? So we talked about it, and we shared, shared scripture, and we talked about these kind of things, that were going on in their life that started with a small issue of hunting and now it got really, really big, as messy as you could imagine. And then we said, hey, well, maybe we need to, to get another party involved here. You know, so I'm sharing with them scripture. I've only been married not very long. And I said, but I know, you know, some counselors that are, you know, godly Christian counselors who are good at this. Maybe let's add them to the conversation, right? And to their credit, they said, yeah, we'll do, we'll, we'll do the work, right? So they're struggling. Things are getting worse. They're working on it. Things are getting worse. They get into counseling um, with a Christian counselor, marriage counselor, and they start working through some stuff. And it was like getting worse, getting worse. They had a breakthrough. And they kept working on their stuff, kept working on their stuff. And fast forward six months. I mean, if you asked me if it was like, hey, are they going to make it? If I was keeping it real with you, I'd be like, probably not. And in six months, their marriage was stronger than it had ever been. But to their credit, they did not give up. They had conflict. They approached, hey, we need some help. We worked through it. It got worse, all right? That's how it works sometimes. We got another party involved. It got worse. It got worse. It got better. And even today, the mess I know, they're doing great. But things got really, really dark for a minute, and they needed somebody from the outside to help them work through this, right? And then we had another person come in, and they helped them walk through this. But they had this conviction in their marriage that they believed God didn't want their marriage to end. But they also knew that they had a real problem to deal with. 
And to their credit, both believers, they worked hard. And the Lord worked through that and strengthened their marriage. There's nothing wrong with getting help. That's what I want you to hear. Okay? There's nothing wrong with it. That's not a, that's not a sign of weakness. Sometimes that's a sign of strength from them. It was that they didn't want to give up. The easy thing would have been, you know, to, to get out when it got real, real bad. But they kept showing up. And they kept working. And I commend them for it. And now, it seems like they have a godly marriage. And that's awesome. And I just want you to know that that's kind of what Paul is getting at in this story. He's not just saying, hey, ah, you know, these goofballs need help. He just knew that sometimes we need extra help. We need an extra hand. We need an extra person involved. Here's what I want you to know. If you're in that spot for any reason, whether that be marriage or just friends or family or coworkers, and it's like, man, I need some help, tell us. Let us know. Me, Tom, Owen, we'll be there after the service. We'd love to help you in any way we can. Sound good? So sometimes getting help, that's a sign of strength, not weakness. That's a sign of you not giving up. In a lot of ways, in these particular situations, that is godly. That's a good thing. Okay? So, reconciliation begins when both people seek God above all else. Agree in the Lord, all right? Even though we're disagreeing on some things, I'm going to decide that the lordship and the kingship of Jesus is above all else. So whatever his word says, I'm going to do. That helps a lot of our issues. But sometimes, even with that mindset, we still need help, okay? We need help to resolve tension, and that's okay. If so, reach out to someone, and let's get that done. So what can I do with this? What can I do with this? I want to give you a couple things if you're already a believer today. And the first one is this. I want us to do some soul searching today. The first one is this. Is there someone you need to forgive? Is there someone you need to forgive? If so, do that good work. I think a lot of times we think about good works as something we do for other people, and a lot of times that's true. But sometimes the good work we need to do is in our own hearts. It begins with that. Is there somebody that you're holding a grudge? Is there someone that um, you know you really haven't released them of the debt of whatever it is? Is there someone that you know you need to forgive? Because the scriptures for the believer are pretty clear. They don't really give us like, a, hey, you don't have to forgive them. Right? You may not find reconciliation for some extreme situations, but the scripture calls us to forgive as we've been forgiven. So my question is, is there somebody that you need to forgive? I prayed for all of us this morning that really that God would bring people to our mind if that's the case. Because just like I told you earlier, like if you've ever lived like a more dramatic life, but that's a lack of peace for whenever you're right before God and others. There's peace there, man. There is a lot of peace that comes on the other side of forgiveness, of forgiving people. If God calls us to do it, it isn't just good for the other person. It's good for us as well. You're his kid as well. He knows what you need as well. There's peace there. So if that's, if that's something, if you got that in your heart, then don't leave today without doing that good work of forgiveness. Talking to the Lord about it, okay? And if you need help, again, we'll be right there after the service. We'd love to talk to you. We'd love to talk to you. Here's the second thing. Do you need to pursue reconciliation? Do you need to pursue reconciliation? So forgiveness can be one-sided. We can decide that on ourselves. I'm going to forgive this person, you know? That guy never knew I was mad at him, Right? And probably he had no reason to think that I was. That was something I had to decide to do. Reconciliation takes both parties, right? There's been an offense, and then we've forgiven, and then we've reconciled. And this can be messy depending on the situation. And sometimes, you know, there are certain situations where you do need some boundaries, okay? But in the general sense that this is just beef, right? Reconciliation, man, is a beautiful thing. In the, in the situation of this is something that's happening in our marriage, that's a beautiful thing. In the situation of this is happening in our family, this is a beautiful thing. You know, Jesus used the example of like remembering that you have problems with somebody and leaving the altar and going to make it right and then coming back. Like he's trying to make the point that this biblical unity in the community of Christ is to be of highest order, that we make things right, 
with our brothers and sisters when they're not. And I want to encourage you that if that's a thing, do the hard work there. And again, if you need help, please reach out. Again, that is not a sign of weakness. I talk to other people about my stuff, my questions. Hey, how would you handle this situation, right? A lot of times it's Joe, one of our pastors, okay? I say, hey, man, what would you do in this? How do I need to handle this? How would I talk to somebody about this? Do the hard work of reconciliation. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing, but if you need help, please reach out. We'll be right there after the service. Pray, give you wisdom. We can meet at a separate time. We're in for all of it, okay? And just a heads up, I want to encourage you in this. If you ever wonder, like, is it a bother to Brian or Joe or Owen or Ryan or whoever? Is it a bother? I just want to let you know it's not a bother. This is what we do, okay? So if you need to have lunch or coffee or whatever or meet after church, we're here to help. That's what God's called us to do. Last thing is this. Be saved. For some of us, it's not that, hey, I'm a believer. I know that part. I got to work on forgiveness. I got to work on reconciliation. But it might be that you're here today and you're like, man, honestly, I've never been saved. And saved in the New Testament sense means this, to have your sins forgiven by God and to receive eternal life, okay? And this isn't something that happens if you achieve enough good works that you acquire it. But the Bible teaches us that it happens by grace through faith. Paul in Ephesians, the same letter I referenced earlier, he says this, For you are saved, forgiven of your sins, receive eternal life, by grace, grace being that God's treated you better than you deserve to be treated, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. This is a gift from God that we receive by faith in Christ alone. And my question to you today is, have you made that personal and conscious decision to place the weight of your soul on the finished work of Christ. Like when you think about one day I'm going to die and I'm going to either go to heaven or not go to heaven, what are you banking your assessment on? The scripture says the only solid ground for salvation is Jesus alone and faith in him. He's done the work to save you. You receive that salvation by faith upon question is, have you done that? And if you have it and you want to do that, I want to invite you to do it. Because in the same way where there's great peace whenever you're reconciled and you forgive and you're reconciled with another person, let me tell you this. The greatest peace you will ever feel in all of your life is whenever you are made right with God again. The reconciliation of I was a sinner in need of saving with no way of saving myself to being a child of God because of the grace of God and simply we believed upon Jesus and now I've gone from enemy to son or daughter of God by the grace of God through faith in him alone. There is peace that lasts for all of eternity there. For some of us, maybe that's what we need. So let's do this. Everybody kind of close your eyes. I want us to just kind of have a little time of, of prayer before we sing again. If you're a believer today, I want you to wrestle with those two big questions that I asked. Is there someone you need to forgive? And is there reconciliation you need to pursue? These are godly efforts that Paul cared enough about that before he wrapped the letter, he mentioned to these two women whom he loved, hey, agree in the Lord. Work this out reconciliation is to be expected in the family of God if you're a believer I just want you to wrestle with those two talk to the Lord about it again if you're going to need help we're going to be right over there at the end of the service we are here to help today and the last thing is this maybe for someone it's not that you need to be reconciled to another person right now, but it's that you need to experience the reconciliation between you and God, that you need to be saved, that you need to have your sins forgiven, that you need to receive eternal life, that you need to begin a new relationship, a real relationship with the God of the universe. And if that's you today, and I want you to pray something like this in your heart, this isn't like a magic word prayer, 
but hopefully just a reflection of your heart of faith back to God. So if that's you today, pray something like this. Say, God, I believe that what Jesus did, his death, his burial, his resurrection, I believe his work is enough to save me. And today I'm putting all my hope and all my faith in being saved on him. God, today, would you forgive me of all my sin because you're the only one that can. Would you give me eternal life because you're the only one that can. And God, today I give you my life. And we all have a step. I ask God that you reveal, reveal any kind of lack of forgiveness in our hearts today so that we would have things to deal with so we can pursue Christ's likeness. But if this morning you ask God to say that you prayed that with me and you meant it, Right now, with everybody's eyes closed when they're still praying, all I want you to do is just raise your hand and say, yeah, that was me today. I asked God to save me. Amen. Amen. Praise God. That peace is unbelievable. Unbelievable. Something we don't deserve, but what grace God has shown us. So that's what we're going to do. Everybody can open your eyes. We're going to close with a song. Let's share with you some announcements when we'll be out today. But during this song, man, let's sing knowing that God loves us so much that he made a way for us to be reconciled to him by the blood of his son. Let's stand and sing together.
Hey, y'all make some noise if that's your confession today. Jesus lives. Amen. Hey, you guys, y'all can have a seat. Um, my name is Joe. I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and we're so glad that you made it. Uh, maybe this is your first time here, and, and we hope you felt right at home. That's our goal. We want to be a homey church. Um, and so welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, so what we would ask you to do, if this is your first time, or maybe you've been here a few times, but you've never filled this purple card out, um, all we'd ask you to do is just grab that card around you and just, just fill it out. It just helps us to know who God is bringing through the doors of the church and um, who, who, uh, who is here so that we can um, just best serve you, best equip you, best connect you, you just all, the, all of the above. Um, we just want, to, because we really believe in having a church family and, um, and just having a group of people that you can gather with on a regular basis to help you grow in your faith. And so if you could, you're welcome just to tune me out and fill this out. Um, and then, of course, if you're interested in, you know, maybe you raised your hand and um, you uh, raised your hand for salvation. Maybe you even want to fill the card out and then just put the check that salvation box. Uh, that could be helpful for us. Um, and anything else you're interested in the church. If you do that, we always send you a thank you in your email. We're going to send you a gift card uh, just for sharing that because we know how it can be, sharing your information and everything. But um, we will be good stewards of it. Um, and so we really, really appreciate that. Um, we're going to move into a time of giving. And giving is just one of the ways that we worship at the church. And um, we try to use the gift that we collect the financial gifts that we collect as a church, we always put that towards um, the gospel and getting the gospel out and discipling people and serving people that are in need and stuff like that. So like right now we're doing shoe boxes and like people um, have brought their uh, Operation Christmas Child boxes. And like one of the ways that like your giving can help is like we put that towards shipping that we can send overseas to a child who has nothing i mean and and so um you know we're going to talk about that a little bit more in detail but this is just one of one of the many ways that we're using your financial contribution um to make a difference and so uh there's multiple ways that you can give to the church you can give online you can use the the qr code up there uh some people like to snap a picture with their phone of just of that graphic so that they can always have the info that they need to give whenever they want to give uh, but you can give through text giving, you can give through Zelle, and then, of course, we have a giving box on the way out if you want to drop your gift in there. Um, that is uh, always, always our prayer is we're going to use that um, to the greatest of our abilities to, to serve the gospel and to spread the gospel. And so we just thank you guys for your generosity and just who you are as a church. And um, you guys always, uh, y'all always uh, meet the task. Y'all always show up. So we're really thankful for y'all. Um, okay, so back to the shoe boxes, as you can see. Some of you, maybe you can't see, but we've got some shoe boxes already here starting to pile up. Um, Operation Christmas Child, and this is run by an organization called Samaritan's Purse, and it is a wonderful organization where you can pack a shoe box, and then we send it um, overseas to kids that just uh, are living in poverty, destitute, just bad, bad conditions. Um, and they have nothing. But what's really cool is there are missionaries that are overseas and they're sharing the gospel with these kids. And so what they're doing is they're being very intentional about not only giving them a gift just to show them, hey, we love you and like we, we care about you. Somebody's thinking about you. Um, but they also are very intentional about sharing the gospel with these kids and giving them an opportunity to know Christ. And so we wouldn't we wouldn't uh, encourage you to give or participate in something that we weren't sure uh, was gospel oriented and making a difference in the lives of these kids. And this is something that we are confident that absolutely meets that mark. And so um, here's the good news. For some of you, you're like, man, I never got around to doing my shoebox. I really wanted to do it. We are extending it for a week. So you actually have another week to do it, okay? Um, so it can be any shoebox, just any shoebox you have in your house, or I think there's even places you can buy a shoebox or some shoeboxes or whatever. Uh, that seems like a Hobby Lobby thing to me. I don't really know for sure. You can get what? You can get a plastic Rubbermaid container as well, and you can use that. And they even like, they even say that's good because it's durable, and kids, that they view the box in itself a gift, okay? Um, and so they use it, they repurpose it. And so that's another thing you can do. One of the things practically I would just tell you really quick is you don't, don't seal the box. 
like don't completely wrap it in wrapping paper because they are going to have to go through it and make sure like they have to check the contents of the box so don't go through the trouble of doing that if you want to wrap it you can wrap the top cover by itself and then wrap the bottom cover by itself they have to be able to remove that um now grab this card around you um, if you're interested in doing a shoebox, really, even if you're not that interested in doing a shoebox, just grab this card and then scan it with your camera. It's going to take you to how to build a box. It's really not that difficult. And so if you could scan this, take this card with you. This is yours to keep. Um, but scan that QR code. It'll show you how to build a box. And you get to bring that box in on Sunday. We're going to put it in here. And then we are going to deliver those on Monday to a drop-off location where they're going to get sent off. If you're like, hey, I don't have time to build a box, but I do want to give specifically to this purpose. I want to help pay the shipping of these boxes. It's $10 a box to ship because we're sending them a long ways, okay? If you want to give that, just use uh, the designation box. There should be like a drop-down menu and indicate missions, right, Brian? Put missions. You want to give towards missions, and we will include that in the shipping, and that's a way that you can help. If you're like, man, I can't build a box, but I can give towards this to help you guys out. So if you have questions, you can, um, you can just get with me. You can get with um, uh, Dan. Was it Dan? You started the mission. Yeah, Dan over there. You, yeah, Dan kind of brought this to us. We thought it was a great idea. Um, so anyways, that's that. Use this card. Take it with you. You have until next Sunday to do it. So you get a bonus week. So hopefully um, that will motivate us. Um, and then, of course, if you made a decision um, to follow Christ, maybe you raised your hand, maybe you didn't, um, and you have questions about what it means to follow Jesus, we are going to be up here for you. Um, we have got res resources for you. We have got um, Bible, journal, whatever whatever it is you need, we want to help you and equip you in your relationship with God. And then also, if you need, man, if you need help, like Brian said, if you're working through um, maybe a difficult uh, relational situation or circumstance or whatever, like come to the front and let us know. Um, we want to help you with that. And then here's my last thing. Um, we are hosting Next Steps today. And if you want to be a part of Next Steps, maybe you weren't planning on coming. That's perfectly fine. Next Steps is a lunch that we have for people who are newer to the church. And we help you learn a little bit more about Progression Church, who we are, and where your place is in Progression Church, where you can contribute. Um, if you want to get more involved, this is literally for you. Whether you've been here for the first time today, maybe you didn't even sign up, just jump in. We don't care. Hop in. Um, we're going to feed you Raisin Canes. It's already in the lobby available to you. Um, um, but we want, you know, let's just designate that for people that come to Next Steps. Um, and so if I could just get uh, some fellas to really, I think we'll only need two tables in here. If after we finish here, if you can roll in some tables, we're going to have next steps in this room. So if you're going to participate, go grab your food, bring it in here, just start eating. Don't You don't even have to wait. Just start serving, come up in here, and uh, we're going to do next steps, and it's, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. All right, we love you guys. Y'all are dismissed. <laughs>